The Master Key System Part 5 Enclosed herewith, you'll find Part 5. After studying this part carefully, you'll see that every conceivable force or object or fact is the result of mind and action. Mind and action is thought, and thought is creative. Men are thinking now as they never thought before. Therefore, this is a creative age, and this world is awarding its richest prizes to the thinkers. Matter is powerless, passive, inert. Mind is force, energy, power. Mind shapes and controls matter. Every form which matter takes is but the expression of some pre-existing thought, but thought works no magic transformations. It obeys natural laws, it sets in motion natural forces, it releases natural energies, it manifests in your conduct and actions, and these in turn react upon your friends and acquaintances and eventually upon the whole of your environment. You can originate thought and since thoughts are creative, you can create for yourself the things you desire. At least 90% of our mental life is subconscious, so that those who fail to make use of this mental power live within very narrow limits. The subconscious can and will solve any problems for us if we know how to direct it. The subconscious processes are always at work. The only question is, are we to be simply passive recipients of this activity, or are we to consciously direct the work? Shall we have a vision of the destination to be reached, the dangers to be avoided, or shall we simply drift? We have found that mind pervades every part of the physical body and is always capable of being directed or impressed by authority coming from the objective or the more dominant portion of the mind the mind which pervades the body, is largely the result of heredity, which, in turn, is simply the result of all the environments of all past generations on the responsive and ever-moving life forces. An understanding of this fact will enable us to use our authority when we find some undesirable trait of character manifesting. We can consciously use all the desirable characteristics with which we have been provided and we can repress and refuse to allow the undesirable ones to manifest. Again, this mind which pervades our physical body is not only the result of hereditary tendencies, but is the result of home, business, and social environment, where countless thousands of impressions, ideas, prejudices, and similar thoughts have been received. Much of this has been received from others, the results of opinions, suggestions, or statements. Much of it is the result of our own thinking, but nearly all of it has been accepted with little or no examination or consideration. The idea seemed plausible, the conscious received it, passed it on to the subconscious, where it was taken by the sympathetic system and passed on to be built into our physical body. The word has become flesh. This, then, is the way we are consistently creating and recreating ourselves. We are today the result of our past thinking, and we shall be what we are thinking today. The law of attraction is bringing to us not the things we should like, or the things we wish for, or the things someone else has, but it brings us our own, the things which we have created by our thought processes, whether consciously or unconsciously. Unfortunately, many of us are creating these things unconsciously. If either of us were building a home for ourselves, how careful we would be in regard to the plans. How we should study every detail. How we should watch the material and select only the best of everything. And yet, how careless we are when it comes to building our own mental home, which is infinitely more important than any physical home as everything which can possibly enter into our lives depends upon the character of the material which enters into the construction of our mental home. What is the character of this material? We have seen that it is the result of the impressions which we have accumulated in the past and stored away in our subconscious mentality. If these impressions have been of fear, 
of worry, of care, of anxiety, if they have been despondent, negative, doubtful, then the texture of the material which we are weaving today will be of the same negative material. Instead of being of any value, it will be mildewed and rotten and will bring us only more toil and care and anxiety. We shall be forever busy trying to patch it up and make it appear at least genteel. If we have stored away nothing but courageous thought, if we have been optimistic, positive, and have immediately thrown any kind of negative thought on the scrap pile, have refused to have anything to do with it, have refused to associate with it or become identified with it in any way, what then is the result? Our mental material is now of the best kind. We can weave any kind of material we want. We can use any color we wish. We know that the texture is firm, that the material is solid, that it will not fade, and we have no fear, no anxiety concerning the future. There is nothing to cover. There are no patches to hide. These are psychological facts. There is no theory or guesswork about these thinking processes. There is nothing secret about them. In fact, they are so plain that everyone can understand them. The thing to do is to have a mental house cleaning and to have this house cleaning every day and keep the house clean. Mental, morale, and physical cleanliness are absolutely indispensable if we are to make progress of any kind. When this mental house cleaning process has been completed, the material which is left will be suitable for the making of the kind of ideals or mental images which we desire to realize. There is a fine estate awaiting a claimant. Its broad acres, with abundant crops, running water, and fine timber, stretch away as far as the eye can see. There is a mansion, spacious and cheerful, with rare pictures, a well-stocked library, rich hangings, and every comfort and luxury. All the heir has to do is to assert his heirship, take possession, and use the property. He must use it, he must not let it decay, for use is the condition on which he holds it. To neglect it is to lose possession. In the domain of mind and spirit, in the domain of practical power, such an estate is yours. You are the heir. You can assert your heirship and possess and use the rich inheritance. Power over circumstances is one of its fruits. Health, harmony, and prosperity are assets upon its balance sheet. It offers you poise and peace. It costs you only the labor of studying and harvesting its great resources. It demands no sacrifice except the loss of your limitations, your servitude, your weakness. It clothes you with self-honor and puts a scepter in your hand. To gain this estate, three processes are necessary. You must earnestly desire it. You must assert your claim. You must take possession. You admit that those are not burdensome conditions. You're familiar with the subject of heredity. Darwin, Huxley, Hackle, and other physical scientists have piled evidence mountain high that heredity is a law attending progressive creation. It is progressive heredity which gives man his erect attitude, his power of motion, the organs of digestion, blood circulation, nerve force, muscular force, bone structure, and a host of other faculties on the physical side. There are even more impressive facts concerning heredity of mind force. All these constitute what may be called your human heredity. But there is a heredity which the physical scientists have not compassed. It lies beneath and antecedent to all their researches at a point where they throw up their hands in despair saying they cannot account for what they see, this divine heredity is found in full sway. It is the benignant force which decrees primal creation. It thrills down from the divine, direct into every created being. It originates life which the physical scientist has not done, nor ever can do. 
It stands out among all forces supreme, unapproachable. No human heredity can approach it. No human heredity measures up to it. This infinite law flows through you, is you. Its doorways are but the faculties which compromise your consciousness. To keep open these doors is the secret of power. Is it not worthwhile to make the effort? The great fact is that the source of all life and all power is from within. Persons, circumstances, and events may suggest need and opportunities, but the insight, strength, and power to answer these needs will be found within. Avoid counterfeits. Build firm foundations for your consciousness upon forces which flow direct from the infinite source, the universal mind of which you are the image and likeness. Those who have come into possession of this inheritance are never quite the same again. They have come into possession of a sense of power here thereto undreamed of. They can never again be timid, weak, vacillating, or fearful. They're indissolubly connected with omnipotence. Something in them has been aroused. They have suddenly discovered that they possess a tremendous latent ability of which they were heretofore entirely unconscious. This power is from within, but we cannot receive it unless we give it. Use is the condition upon which we hold this inheritance. We are each of us but the channel through which the omnipotent power is being differentiated into form. Unless we give, the channel is obstructed and we can receive no more. This is true on every plane of existence and in every field of endeavor and all walks of life. The more we give, the more we get. The athlete who wishes to get strong must make use of the strength he has and the more he gives, the more he will get. The financer who wishes to make money must make use of the money he has, for only by using it can he get more. The merchant who does not keep his goods going out will soon have none coming in. The corporation which fails to give efficient service will soon lack customers. The attorney who fails to get results will soon lack clients. And so it goes everywhere. Power is contingent upon proper use of the power already in our possession. What is true in every field of endeavor, every experience in life, is true of the power from which every other power known among men is begotten, spiritual power. Take away the spirit and what is left, nothing. If then the spirit is all there is, upon the recognition of this fact, must depend the ability to demonstrate all power, whether physical, mental, or spiritual. All possession is the result of the accumulative attitude of mind or the money consciousness. This is the magic wand which will enable you to receive the idea and it will formulate plans for you to execute and you will find as much pleasure in the execution as in the satisfaction of attainment and achievement. Now, go to your room, take the same seat, the same position as heretofore, and mentally select a place which has pleasant associations. Make a complete mental picture of it, see the buildings, the grounds, the trees, friends, associations, everything complete. At first, you will find yourself thinking of everything under the sun except the ideal upon which you desire to concentrate. But do not let this discourage you. Persistence will win, but persistence requires that you practice these exercises every day without fail.